Well, thank you very much. I'm both proud to be here in my own uh, family restaurant, but more excited to speak to you and the audience and the entire world to give a talk in a format that Dr. Dean Ornish spoke at recently. It gives me extreme pleasure. And I want to shout out to Regina Drews. Hi, Regina, in New York. You're doing amazing work, a integrative cardiologist with an academic hospital position and really an amazing vision for holistic cardiology. So to quote the great Charles Dickens, it is really in cardiology the 30 years I've spent both the best of times and the worst of times because there's barely a field anywhere that has more technology that has the ability to treat people towards the end of a disease process and bring them back to function and good life. But the worst of times we've seen in the last few months, how can Bob Harper have a heart attack at age 51? How was that not detected? How did our system fail? How did Carrie Fisher, how did Bill Paxton end up having bypass surgery and not know that 10 years earlier? So he didn't need bypass surgery. We have a problem. And 50 years ago, Dr. Dennis Burkett, famous for Burkett's lymphoma, talked of an analogy where the sink is running and the sink is running and the sink is overflowing and everybody's mopping up to control it. Nobody thinks about turning off the sink. Dr. Dean Ornish has used that example in his lectures and I'll use it in mine. Functional medicine, the evolution of cardiology has got to go to looking at why is the sink overflowing and turning off the root causes and the root sources. So we've become a uh, specialty of cardiology that has distanced ourselves from patients, has distanced ourselves from simple solutions and root causes. And what James talked about, 80 to 90% proven scientific ability to prevent that heart attack, to prevent that stroke, is something we've just not capitalized on and something that I've dedicated a lot of energy, and I'll speak about that. So we have this great heritage in medicine and cardiology going back a thousand years to the famous physician and caliphate advisor Maimonides, no disease that can be treated by diet should be treated with any other means. The founder of the Mayo Clinic, the aim of medicine is to prevent disease and prolong life. The ideal of medicine is to eliminate the need of a physician. And I ask you to predict how old is this quote? A heart attack after age 80 is an act of God or God's will, but a heart attack before age 80 is a medical failure. Now that might sound like a very current quote, and heart attack before age 80, a Bob Harper, a Carrie Fisher, a Bill Paxton, a James Gandolfino is a medical failure, which I believe very strongly. It's a complete breakdown of the technology we have. That was said by Paul Dudley White, who was chief of cardiology at Harvard, who was President Eisenhower's physician, it was said in 1955. And the picture in the middle is Dr. Dudley White in a tie in Italy with the famous Dr. Ansel Keys, because they knew early on your food choice, your fitness choice, your love choice and your sleep choice made tremendous differences in your health. But somewhere we lost our way and we became, in my field, very high tech and high tech started to replace high touch. So two pioneers uh, to your left in the white jacket is Dr. Mason Soans, who accidentally discovered you can put a catheter in a heart artery, you can inject dye, and the patient doesn't die themselves. So we started a field of technology and coronary angiography. Very important, but the patient was draped, and I remember in 10 to 15,000 catheterizations I did, my patient was that big, that was the little hole in the drape that I dealt with. Next to him is Dr. Rene Favillaro giving him a hug, the first physician at the Cleveland Clinic and around the world to do a bypass operation. They're wonderful physicians. And to the right is Dr. Andreas Grunzig from Zurich, moved to Emory University, the first angioplasty, first in legs, then in human hearts, found out people didn't die when you put a balloon in their heart arteries. Incredible breakthroughs in technology, but the beginning of separating the physician and the patient the healthcare provider and the patient that has removed the focus on the human nature of medicine to some degree. And few have said it better than the famous Dr. Mehmet Oz. What we have now is doctors who are actually better technically than they're do what they're doing than their specialty in 30 to 40 years. But we lost the relationship when doctors would look people in the eye, because now we look at laptops, and say, I care about you. We can do this together. We can beat this problem. And the question is, how can we use multiple modalities and community and all that we're going to talk about today to bring back that eye-to-eye -eye contact with a patient, let them know we care about them, let them know we love them. So how do we regain that when 
this quote, I spent years studying nutrition in med school, said no doctor ever. And that can be said about mind body and that can be said about sleep and that can be said about stress management because as a group, we aren't always the healthiest. We aren't always the low stress. And we certainly aren't always the best fed. I just came back from a conference in Washington from the American College of Cardiology dedicated to studying cancer heart interactions and the food served were known carcinogens according to the World Health Organization. There's a disconnect and I can only look to a brighter future but the current status is a lost path for regaining that tradition. So I've had an interesting career I never would have predicted. The picture on the right is that this is my 40 year journey through the Sinai Desert, a little like Moses. Uh, I walked into the cafeteria on my first day of undergrad, University of Michigan, 1977, with that nice woman over there as my girlfriend, and we both decided that day we're giving up meat. It wasn't Lent, it was disgusting, and we became, ve <laughs> truly, we became vegetarians 40 years ago out of just an impulse. Now the man that's hugging me and I'm hugging him in the green tie was somebody I met six months ago who was the food director in that dorm on that day, and when I lectured to the Dietitians Association, he came up and said, I'm the reason you've been vegetarian and vegan for 40 years. You really owe me a thank you, so thanks to him. But along my career as a cardiologist, I had the great honor to train with a gentleman with a mustache in the middle, Dr. Jeffrey Hartzer in Kansas City, Missouri. At that time, the single most exciting, high-tech, and most advanced center in the world to train to learn how to put balloons in arteries and relieve cardiac obstruction. I can't recall in the city of Masterpiece KC barbecue sauce ever hearing about nutrition, but man, we became great technicians. But fortunately for me, I was carrying this undergraduate tradition of spending some time on my nutrition. And then fortunately, I was influenced very early in my career by the gentleman on the right, Dr. Dean Ornish, in a fairly recent picture, and I wanna tell you about that story because it transformed my practice, and it really was serendipity. It wasn't thought out. So in case you aren't aware of Dr. Dean Ornish, he developed a program, which is the graphic on the right, that combined a early introduction he had to Eastern medicine in his house in Dallas, Texas, where his father was a prominent orthodontist. And he understood the influence of mind and body uh, early in his career. But he developed what he called the lifestyle heart trial, where he took a plant-based diet without added oil, controversial maybe, less than 10% of calories from fat total. He did exercise, which in these cardiac patients was largely just walking. He anticipated long before that you didn't need a marathon to be healthy. You needed standing and motion and walking. He combined it with stress management using yoga, meditation and such. And really what he would tell you is the key is number four, support, getting together on a regular basis, like a group I'll talk about in a little bit, the Plant-Based Nutrition Support Group, finding your peers, walking the distance with other people who are walking the same path. And they met and they became friends and they loved and supported. And Dr. Ornish would tell you that's the most important program of his healing program. He did randomized trials that, if you look at the date, this paper was published three weeks after I started my first job in cardiology as this cath lab animal who happened to like salad more than steak. But then I learned three weeks into my career, I could heal with a salad as much as I could heal with a stent. And I pursued both paths because they both were part of the toolbox. Dr. Ornish followed up his study, if you look at the graph on the right, 1998, a paper that should have transformed medicine worldwide and been in every cafeteria and every patient chart and every patient uh, discharge program. But these are patients that were randomized to either yoga, stress, love, support, exercise, and a plant-based diet, or they got standard cardiology care, and they agreed to have a baseline heart catheterization and another one five years later. The curve that goes up is what happens to your heart arteries if you see and are treated in a standard cardiology clinic. Year after year after year, your blockages get worse. The lower curve is what happens if you follow a program that's comprehensive, lifestyle oriented, oriented and supported by community. You actually can reverse atherosclerosis. This is the most high-tech technology available then and to this date, and there's no question about it, this terrible, terrible illness that causes so much pain, suffering, and loss can be reversed. It's never been questioned since it's acknowledged. Well, why is the basis of it plant-based diets? Why is that diagram that James showed have that beautiful, whole food, fiber-rich olive 
at the middle, and olive, not olive oil in the middle. And that's because we know that there's just nutrients in plants found nowhere else. There's the fiber, there's the phytonutrients, antioxidants, carotenoids, we can go on and on, magnesium. We can make it very academic, but the point is we were born to eat lots of plants. We can talk about how many in a minute. This is a study done three years ago that looked, can you dose fruits and vegetables like a medication? And what impact does it have on your risk of heart disease, your risk of cancer, and your overall chance of surviving during a study period? And as you can see, from uh, zero to one servings of fruits and vegetables a day in a fairly high risk of all these problems, you can drop 30 to 40% your risk of developing the chronic diseases in America by simply eating a lot of fruits and vegetables. This plateaued around four to six servings a day, which in the United States is far beyond the average of 1.5 servings of fruits and vegetables a day. In fact, less than 1% of children are reaching nutritional and lifestyle targets in this country right now with the current target to move that to 1%. So nutrition is powerful. Plants are healing. Plants are information. Plants are medication. And I apologize, this is a bit wordy, but just two weeks ago in the international Journal of Epidemiology, an even larger study, just hang with me here, a meta-analysis of the 95 best studies involving 2 million people who were analyzed for their dietary choices and were followed up. Those that ate 800 grams of fruits and vegetables a day, that is one pound and three quarters. That is the biggest bowl you have in your house getting filled with kale and romaine and strawberries and blueberries and whatever else you want to put in your personal blender. But one and three quarters pounds of fruits and vegetables a day will reduce your risk of cancer, heart disease, stroke, and all-cause mortality, every malady that makes our patients weak, makes our patients frail, and robs our patients of age, can be reversed in part by this very, very rich fruit and vegetable diet. Now, that's a challenge, and we all have to ask ourselves, what can we do with our patients to give them a strategy at their home, at their workplace, and maybe when they socialize in restaurants like this, that they can achieve that goal, because it is a, it is a daunting goal. But still, even four to five to six servings a day are, are really powerful and effective. There is simply no possible way to talk any commonality in nutritional philosophies without putting, as we just saw with that beautiful graphic from Dr. David Katz, the centrality that everybody agrees on and nobody should ever disagree. So in my life, I made a shift and it's been a 27-year uh, process since training of being a cath lab animal and a three in the morning heart attack to asking the question, why is this person having a heart attack? And was there something I could have done earlier and something for other patients I can do earlier? So I transitioned the picture on the right is my last year in Kansas City with Dr. Barry Rutherford in the middle. That's me in the white jacket with a mustache, painfully much younger than now. And uh, Dr. Jeff Hartzer, blessed memory, uh, holding the styrofoam coffee cup, which if I had known better, I would have asked him to put that in glass, but that was a long time ago. <laughs> to now where we're standing, Green Space Cafe and our commitment, my commitment, my family's commitment to, in every path we can take, uh, add to the community's awareness of this power of healing and this power of integration and this power of community support. So I've taken a very active role, hopefully some of you have seen a few of the pieces, as a blogger everywhere, as a podcast guest everywhere, as a speaker during Heart Month. I don't charge during Heart Month. You want me to come to your flower shop or your law firm, it's Heart Month. We need the message out that heart disease is reversible, that we're all at risk. I don't care if you're thin, I don't care if you're exercised, because that's Bob Harper. I don't care you know, if you have family history or not, we need to define and extending it to TV and other modalities. So I developed a clinic about a year and a half ago as a place where I could do advanced work to define for people that are willing to come to see me the nature of their disease and plans for reversal. It's a little hard to see, but on the upper left are labs that were done with a patient who was willing to adopt a totally bacon-driven diet and become plant-based for 30 days, and they had the opportunity to do very advanced labs uh, before and after, and amazing drops in inflammation, amazing drops in cholesterol, amazing drops in a new marker called TMAO that's derived out of animal products in the microbiome, and the power of just 30 days on changing our physiology, whether it's totally, partially, but always fruit and vegetable rich diets. Tracking atherosclerosis by advanced carotid ultrasounds and demonstrating that this terrible, terrible disease, if identified early, even identified late in the process, is a reversible beast 
the percentage of stenosis will go down. And very grateful Crane's business recognized my clinic as a special healing place, and uh, I am proud of that moment. So we overlook these root causes. I won't name anybody in particular, but do we know how they sleep? Do we know the quality? We know we'll speak in a few minutes on our panel about the importance of obstructive sleep apnea. Stress, the big, big elephant in most medical practices that rarely gets addressed. The mind-body, using love, using technology like heart math, like headspace, like any other, uh, the Kirtan Kriya. Uh, looking at the mouth of a source of inflammation and a source of root causes of disease that's often overlooked. Looking for early calcification of vessels. I can't tell you, I have a clinic dedicated to part to what's called cardio-oncology, cancer patients. And I review their CAT scans, the reports, and they mention that the heart arteries are calcified, and they mention that the aorta is calcified, and it's never been recognized as silent but important atherosclerosis. We need to be aware that aging of arteries, as Thomas Sidingham said in the 1600s, a man is as old as his arteries, which obviously applies to women, is an easy thing to review when you're looking at medical data. It's free data. Data. The total ignorance of a very atherosclerotic particle called lipoprotein A, which in 20 to 30 percent of Americans is elevated, is occluding their arteries, and is drawn in less than 5 percent of people at $28 a, a blood test, available in every lab. And lastly, looking for new markers, new root causes, new pathologies. The microbiome, this giant, giant uh, living organism in our body that we barely understand, but knowing now that it's related to atherosclerosis, congestive heart failure, diabetic outcome, and kidney disease itself, and knowing that there are some nutritional-based interventions that may improve if you're willing to measure and follow up on it. Using early diagnosis, this is uh, my a platform that I speak on to the public all the time. Not waiting to find out that you have coronary disease in an emergency room, in a cath lab, or worse, in an autopsy suite. Finding out early, at age 40 and beyond, recent studies in the last two weeks show from age 35 to 45, a calcium scan for $75 in this community can predict the prognosis of that young person for the next 15 years better than any other modality. Yes, there's a small amount of radiation, but it has dropped significantly on par with a mammogram and should not be overlooked. In my last minute or so, I want to talk about the community, the importance of developing community programming, not dependent on doctor's offices, not dependent on hospitals. About three years ago, a very wonderful gentleman in the audience, Paul Chadlin, called me and said, I have reversed my heart disease with a very sophisticated, advanced nutritional protocol at the Cleveland Clinic, but I want some support, I want some peers, I want to meet some people doing the same thing. Can we make a group, which we both thought would involve maybe 25 people in this area of Detroit, and the first meeting had 130, second meeting over 150, and now has 3,400 members, the largest nutrition support group in the world, with no funding, with grassroots, with a lot of sweat, and an amazing volunteer group, some of whom I heard tonight. But this is monthly meetings to bring in world-class speakers, teaching them the importance of nutrition in their life, but also giving them friends and peers and hugs. It involves small groups, pattern on Saddleback Church, pattern on most groups that recognize community support is the magic, is the uh, special sauce. And it involves teaching and training on how to have life skills. There's the willpower and the skill power. And the plant-based nutrition support group, check it out at pbnsg.org, institute it in your own community, get a doctor and a patient that have some passion, and you can change the world. So I suggest that we don't throw away high tech. It's helping lives all the time. But we don't lose high touch. And we focus on high fiber, as I call it, because Dr. Dennis Burke had identified long ago, all health revolves around how much fiber you eat. One of the first duties of a physician is to educate the masses not to take medicine, to treat yourself with lifestyle and love, and we'll all benefit from it. Thank you very much.